My name is Ezra, and I am so glad that you are here. I get to serve as one of the pastors here at Christ Community. What a privilege. It's good to be here with you. If you are new with us, would you let us know? If maybe this is your first or second time and you haven't let us know yet, stop by the welcome desk on the way out um, after our service. Amy is out there, would love to chat with you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to serve you, answer any questions you might have about Christ Community. And if you let us know how we can get a hold of you, we have a gift for you. It's an awesome coffee mug with some good stuff in it. So do that if you are new with us. And online, thanks for joining us. I hit that connect button and we will follow up with you. We would love to connect with you. So something weird happened to me a while back. It, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. I, I'm, I, I, think I, I think I get it. I'll try to summarize it for you like this. I became a pastor I know, weird. And, and what happened, things changed. All of a sudden, I was patient. <laughs> it was great. I used to get really mad when my team lost. I don't do that anymore. Nope, not anymore. I, all of a sudden, I, I consider myself an expert in marriage and parenting. So just so you know, of course, of course I'm kidding. But I will tell you what did change. I, I noticed how people acted around me changed. It's bizarre, not everyone. But, but sometimes, it's bizarre. So, for example, hanging out with some guys, right? And just, just hanging out and just having a good conversation and someone decides to use their choice of words, some choice words. And, and all of a sudden, without fail, like, look at me. I'm sorry, Pastor. I, I, I don't usually say that, right? Of course you don't. That's fine. But it was, it's like this, this need to confess. I don't know what it is. And like, for another, another example, I was talking to a lady. It was when I moved here. And she, she thought she knew I was a pastor, and she said, hey, are you, are you a pastor in town? I said, yeah, and she immediately confessed. She said, this is where I go to church, I go this often, and this is why I haven't been there in four months. It was just this kind of, oh, okay, thank you, I didn't, it, you're, you're good. So maybe we don't all act like that around a pastor, but what about a, what about a celebrity? Like, have you ever met a celebrity? When, when you meet them, do you clam up? Yeah, like, oh, I don't know what to say, or do you just word vomit on them, like just start telling them stories? I don't know what it is. We, we, we act differently. A few months ago, LeBron James was in town. Did you know this? LeBron James. So King James, as he is known in the, in the sports world, King James, he's 6'9", about right here. He's 250, all muscle. The dude's a, he's a beast. He is one of the greatest basketball players of all time, LeBron James. And he was in town. He was in town for a week. Uh, we believe because his son was getting treatment at Mayo, which is good. And when he was here, he practiced uh, at a local high school. He decided to do his workouts and everything at a local high school. And, uh, and some people kind of got word of this, and, and rumors started coming out. And so at the end of the week, he decided to uh, address the student body at this high school. And so there's a video that it's somebody standing right back here, and the curtain is pulled in the auditorium. And, and he's here in the video. So as the curtain opens, LeBron kind of walks up the middle, and you see the, the video pans out, and you see these students in this high school freaking out. I mean, they are jumping up and down. It's LeBron, LeBron's here, he's in the room, are you kidding me? I mean, they're freaking out. They're standing ovation before he says a word. He, like, he just has to step up there, and it, they're going crazy. So, so they interviewed this, this kid for a newsreel. They interviewed this kid who was chosen to rebound for, for one of his shooting sessions. And so, and so he said, you know, he, he couldn't quite describe what it was like in his own words to, like, LeBron, like, he's over there. He's using our weight room. I got to touch the ball that he, you know, like, like are you? so he's freaking out. So the, news, the newscaster, the, the guy, the... Uh, uh, the front desk guy, the news anchor, um, who prepped this story, said this, and it caught my attention. He said, and we talked to a basketball player who got to practice with the king himself. And that got me thinking. If we, if, if we act differently around people that we esteem, if we act differently around people we admire, that we, that we aspire to be like, if it changes our behavior, if we are all attentive, right, to what's going on, LeBron's in the room. It made me wonder, what if we all lived as if the king is in the room? 
what if we all lived as if our king is in the room? So we are in week four of a series on prayer. And uh, we are tracking along with our denomination, the Christian Missionary Alliance, and um, they are doing a 40 days of prayer thing. It's awesome at the beginning of the year, and we have devos for you and all of that. But, um, but this week, in this 40 days of prayer, this week's theme is worship. Worship as prayer, prayer as worship, the intersection of the two. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Today we're gonna explore, dig into the word worship, what it means to worship, and maybe, uh, hopefully, we can have a little bit better understanding to, to what it might be like if we acted like the king was in the room. So we need to start by defining biblical worship. And I was surprised as I was preparing for this that there's not a lot of good biblical definitions of worship that are concise, that are clear, that are, that are comprehensive. I found a couple that were pretty academic, pretty heady, and, and they aligned actually with what we here at Christ Community say, how we, how we talk about worship. And so we're gonna go with our definition um, about worship. And so this is what it is. Worship is our joyful response to what God is doing. It is our joyful response to what God is doing. We talk about, here at Christ Community, we talk about how God is always moving toward us. He is always moving, to, he, he's the initiator. He, he pursues us relentlessly. And our response to that is worship. That's what it is. So as we explore this, um, I, I landed in a psalm that I think is gonna be helpful for us. So Psalm 95, and that's where I'd like to start, and that's where I'd like to begin to hopefully unpack this for you. So let's read the first seven verses. Uh, I'll read them for you. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So let's go, let's do this. So the first thing that jumps off the page to me is in the first line, uh, the first verse, and it's the word sing. It's the word sing. So we're gonna start there, worship through singing. So there's three reasons I wanted to start here. The first reason is because scripture is replete. It is full of references to worship in song. We, we all know this. This is a pretty common psalm, Psalm 95, Psalm 96, 98, 100, 105. There are dozens of psalms that, are, that speak of musical worship, whether it's singing, whether it is instruments, harps and lyres, all over the place. In the New Testament, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, Paul speaks of uh, admonishing one another and teaching one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, or songs of the Spirit, with gratitude, in your hearts, and it is all over the place. Revelation five, so all throughout scripture, from the front to the back, it speaks of worship as song, as singing, as music. The second reason I wanna start here is because music is a gift. Music is a gift. There are, there are things that we can express in music that are kinda hard to express otherwise. I, I find myself, regardless, like, I find myself more apt to dance. I'm not gonna do that. Uh, to, when I hear music, when I'm, when I'm feeling the music, right, there's something in music. It is inherently emotional. We are, we are beings that, were, that we, we were given emotions and feelings. God gave those to us, and music somehow kind of unlocks that for us in a different way. And it's a way that we can respond to God, which is worship, respond to God with what he has given us to do so, to worship with music. And the third reason I wanted to start here is because this is undoubtedly the most common association we have with worship. If I was to ask anyone on the street, most of us, hey, what's the first thing that comes to mind when I say the word worship? Singing, a song. Praise and worship, whatever it is, it, it, it is common. It's, it's kind of our go-to. 
And, and that's a good thing. And, and here's the thing, it's right. It's right. You do worship through song. But if you stop there, you miss a whole lot of what God has given us. So you don't worship just through song. It has to be, it's the starting place, but it is just that, it's a starting point. So I'm gonna move on and we're gonna kind of expand this a little bit for us. So the second thing, if sing is the first word that I noticed, the second word that I noticed in here is the word extol. The word extol. Now we don't use that often in our language, but but um, I'll read it for you. So it's in verse two. So come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving, with gratitude, and extol Him with music and song. Now verse three uh, kind of helps us to begin to unpack what that means. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. So the word extol means to praise highly. It means to glorify, to exalt. In the Latin, it means to lift up, to raise, right? That's some some of our language in praise and worship music comes from this word extol. It's to raise, it's to lift up. We We are lifting up his name. We are expressing his worth. We are expressing God's worth to him. And something happens simultaneously when we do this, especially in worship together, is when we do this, we extol him and we encourage each other. It's a gift that he has given us in worship. And so uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, in what's known as the Song of Moses, there is this line, and it says, ascribe greatness to our God the rock. Ascribe greatness. And that word ascribe uh, is similar here. Uh, I'll, I'll define it I'll define it by making a comparison. So the comparison is the word describe. So if I was to watch a game and then talk to my buddy later, I would tell him what happened. I would relay what happened in the game. I'd be describing the game, right? So, so this is not, ascribing is, is similar, but it's not relaying, it is reflecting. If I ascribe greatness to God, I am reflecting back to him what he already knows. I'm not telling him he's great and he's surprised. He knows this. But to ascribe means that we are in on it. We are actively ascribing greatness to him. So that's kind of the idea of extol, is we elevate, we raise, we ascribe. And this happens in musical worship, of course. But it's not just there. We can ascribe greatness through our, through our thoughts, through our conversations, through our words, uh, through, through our prayers. We can ascribe. And so it does happen in musical worship but it, is, it begins to, to bleed out into other areas of our life. This is worship. This is our response to what, to what God is doing for us and in us. And the third takeaway in this, we're gonna jump down to verse six. The third thing is, is in verse six. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. Let us bow down, let us kneel. Now those are both, together, the meaning there is to submit. It's to submit. Or bestow honor to one by submitting oneself. And so, so when you bow down, when you, when you kneel, right, you take a posture, a physical posture that reminds you, I, I, am, I am making myself low, right? And, and I am, I'm taking that posture in submission. Another way to think about this is, is sacrifice. It's personal sacrifice. So, so in submission, I am sacrificing what I want for something I want more. It's sacrificing what I know for something, for something that, that perhaps the Lord knows that I, doesn't, that I don't. So uh, you're, you're sacrificing something important uh, like it's kind of like in, in baseball, um, there's a play called a sacrifice fly. So, so what you do, if I'm up to bat, right, normally I would want to hit and I would get, get on base, right, normally. But in a sack fly, in a sacrifice fly, what I do is I hit it as hard as I can and as far as I can so that my guy, who's on third base usually, can make it home and score for our team even though I get out. If I get out and they can't throw it in fast enough, I have made a sacrifice fly. I have, I have sacrificed what I want, what's good for me, for what is better, 
what is better for us, what's better for the team. That's the idea of sacrifice. And for me, when I read this in Psalm 95, it takes me right to Romans 12. Romans 12 is a common passage in the New Testament, and it reads like this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and this is your true and proper worship. The language of living sacrifice, the idea of living sacrifice, it, it flows to the corners of your life. It's not just here on the weekend in service. It's not just when you are praying. It's not just when you are in a conversation about the word. Like This goes to all of the corners of your life, a living sacrifice, everything that I have. And if we, if we believe that, if we act like that, all of a sudden, our perspective of, and sometimes my perspective of worship, you know, my, my narrow perspective that happens here when we sing together, like, that blows the lid off of that definition. If, if living sacrifice bleeds into everything, then that means everything. So it really, it really is something, it moves from, uh, from being something we do here to, to a lifestyle, to, to a mindset. So hopefully, the sequence through this psalm, kind of working through, talking about musical worship, and then ascribing, um, talking about extolling, and then kind of the personal, the, the sacrificing of yourself, hopefully that helps us to maybe think about it a little bit bigger and a little bit more. So what I want to do now for the rest of our time is I want to get practical. I want to get practical. So we're going to go right back to this psalm, and I think there's a theme in here that can help us understand and, and kind of focus in on what we need to do or what we should do. And so um, the, the, the three verses that I'm going to pull up are the three that I mentioned, one, two, and six earlier. And there are six words in here, sing, shout, come, extol, bow down, and kneel. Those are six great ways to worship. Those are six great ways to worship, but that is not an exhaustive list. There are, there are numerous, innumerable ways that we can worship. What this list tells me, the theme here, they're all verbs. They're all verbs. Worship is active. Worship is not passive. It is not something that you just kind of sleepwalk into. Worship is active. It is intention. When you respond to what God is doing in your life, you have to... You have to think about it. It has to touch your mind, it has to touch your heart and your soul. It is an active response to what God is doing in your life. And so I wanna suggest three things that we can actively do together here uh, so that it might help us to, to, uh, to, to understand and to worship uh, better and more. So the first two things that I'm gonna suggest are kind of individual things. They're, they're things that you can at least start on your own. And the third, we're gonna practice together, so this will be fun. So, the first thing uh, is this. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. The way that we get to know God is by reading his word, and we can know him better. And believe me, I have sat where you sit, and, and I'm thinking, oh, it's hard like all the shame and guilt comes across, right? Like I've, I've tried, Ezra, I've tried. Reading your Bible's hard. I don't get it or it's confusing or I don't have time or things come up or whatever it is. I understand. This is not a guilt and a shame thing. This is, a, this is how we get to know our Lord, through reading your Bible. And I think, this is not a magic bullet, but I think that we do something here that can help you in this and it's called daily Bible reading. It's called DBR, daily Bible reading. And what it is, it is simply connecting on the Bible app, on your phone, connecting with other people here, and then joining a group and reading together. That's what it is. That's what it is. And so, the, <laughs> New Year's resolutions, um, what are we, end of January, 80% of them have failed by now. 80% of New Year's resolutions have failed by now, within a month. Because most of them, you are charging at something solo. I'm gonna do this, this is my new goal, I'm gonna hit the gym, I'm gonna whatever it is, and, and they, they fail because you're trying to do it alone. The beauty of DBR is you're not alone. And 
you can fail. You can, I, I've been doing this for a couple months with some guys here, and sometimes a guy will miss a day. Sometimes he'll miss two. Sometimes he'll miss a week or an entire plan. And, you know, I'll, I'll chat with them out in the lobby, and, you know, there's this, like, oh, man, I know, I know I should do it. It's okay. It, this is a guilt-free zone. Just, just get back in tomorrow. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, so no shame, no guilt, but this is a way that you, can, that you can maybe step into this with some holy accountability that helps you to step into something that you might wanna do. The second thing that I would suggest is to move prayer into unexplored areas in your life. Just pray differently. Prayer is one of the primary ways that we worship our Lord. But you can sleepwalk through it. Sometimes I do. So I pray with my kids every night, unless I go to bed before they do. I pray with them every night, and I pray with them individually. And sometimes I catch myself saying the same words, the same way, to the same kid. I, I can sleepwalk through it. it is, it's something that happens because it's like a habit. It's like a habit. And habits are good. Habits are good. Think of like driving a car. Driving a car is good. So um, <laughs> unless you're teaching a teen how to drive a car. So driving a car, so think about all the things you have to do while you're driving a car. All the th- you have to think about the gas and the brake and steering and the wipers and the blinker and looking at my mirrors. All, like there's a thousand things to think about when you're driving. Imagine if you had to think about all of those things. It'd be exhausting. Oh, a car pulled out in front of me. Move my foot over to the left, compress the brake, and we, like, no, you, you, you do it because it's a habit. But the downside of habits is that you just do it. So if you pray before your meal, great. This week, I prayed in the middle of the meal. It freaked my family out. Like, I, the, why, why aren't we praying now? Why are we praying that? Like, so change it up. One way that you can activate kind of a new attention to what you're doing by just changing something. If you pray before bed, great, do it. If you don't, try it. If you pray the first thing in the morning, great. If you don't, try it. Instead of going to the coffee maker first, like I do, right, slip out of bed. Take a submission posture, right, and pray. Try it. It's It's just so that you are engaging in a different way. You are worshiping actively. Try sticky notes. Try sticky notes. Write pray or write a verse or write a a friend's name on your dashboard, on your mirror. Don't obstruct your view on on your, your kitchen, in your bathroom, on the back of your front door. It doesn't matter. Use a sticky note. They can be just visual reminders of doing something different. Pray differently because we can sleepwalk through this, but to actively worship, to actively engage, to respond to what God is doing, it takes mind, body, soul, it, so, so change, change things up. The only way that you can mess up prayer is by not praying. That's the only way you can mess it up. So those are two things that we can do individually to respond in worship to God. So what about all of us together? So we can talk about all of this, and we can learn, and we can think about it and think, yeah, okay, okay, that's good. Haven't thought about it that way, that's good. Friends, that means nothing unless we do something about it. So we're gonna do something about it. The, uh, the only way you can mess up worship is by not worshiping. So here is the plan. I'm gonna ask our band to come back out, and as they get ready, we are going to together just review, recap what we've discussed here, and in preparation for our, our final song, I want to invite you to, to lean in to maybe something that, okay, I can pay more attention to this. Remember that as we, as we worship, the more we attend, the more we are active in it, that glorifies God more. So here are the things. Here are the things. We are responding 
to God, to what God is doing. We are responding with joy, gratitude, and submission to what God is doing in our worship. If that's your thing, just think about joy, gratitude, submission. That is how I'm going to worship. Second thing, worship is active. It requires us to lean in. It, it might even require a posture of you. Like if you're, if you're sitting there, it might be that you lean forward. It might be that you do this. I don't, I'm from the Midwest, I do this, maybe, right? But it, it's a posture. If, if, that, if it's you, do it, do it. Act into it and don't judge other people for what they're doing or not doing. Just, just lean in to worship. It is a posture, it's an active response. Third thing, we are expressing or ascribing worth to our Lord. Uh, one of the lyrics in the song that we're gonna sing together is, you have no rival, you have no equal. These are things that God knows. We are ascribing, we are reflecting it back to him because it brings him glory and it brings our attention upward. You have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. He knows it, but it brings to mind, and we worship. And the fourth thing is, the king is near. The king is near. What if we all changed our posture and our response and our approach to worship because we were aware that our king is in the room. He's here. And we get to join him and we get to join each other in worship to him because of that. So let me pray for us as we prepare for worship together. Lord, it is good to talk about these things. It's even better to do it. So as we, as we practice, as we respond to all the things that you're doing with joy and gratitude and submission, as we do that, Lord, meet us here, be kind, and penetrate our hearts in ways that, that you only can if we are paying attention. Lord, we are grateful, and we ask you to meet us here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Death could not hold you. The veil tore.